Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar, Children's Behaviour and Our Interactions. Thanks for coming today. My name is Jamile Bowler. Today, Bridget Barden, who you can see below me, and I will be considering how our interactions and relationships influence children's behaviour. Bridget and I are both Kids Matter consultants. Kids Matter is funded by the Department of Health and Beyond Blue. Early Childhood Australia is partnering with Beyond Blue and in school context, Headspace, to support whole services and schools in implementing the Kids Matter framework and undertaking the professional learning that goes along with it. Is your service or school registered and participating in Kids Matter? If you are, great news because our webinars will support your progress through the professional learning. And we have a whole series of webinars available over the, the coming months. Many people know and use Kids Matter resources, but are not aware of the added value of actually registering to participate in Kids Matter. Registering activates the support of an individual consultant and additional resources to support implementation of the framework. This is known to make a positive difference in promoting mental health and wellbeing in early learning services and schools. You can register right now by clicking the registration link that's in the chat and filling in the form. You'll find that the chat on the bottom left hand corner of your screen and you can use the chat to ask questions you may have, make comments and respond to questions we may ask during today's session and we will be asking a few questions today. So, let, uh, let's get back to today, children's behaviour and our interactions. Just waiting for the next slide to move on. So before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge, I'd like to, <laughs> I've lost my slide. I think we're on, we're, it needs to go back one slide, I think. Before we go on any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians from all the land that we are on today, that we're gathering on today. And not only acknowledge, but also pay my respects to elders past and present and future, and all those who continue to hold the memories, traditions and ways of being for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm on the land of the Ngunnawal people, and Bridget's on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We'd love to see the land you're on today. Um, if you just add that to our chat, that'd be great. We recognise the importance of continued connection to culture, country and community, to the health, social and emotional wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Let's take a moment to reflect on how we connect with all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people because today we will be discussing our interactions with children and how this can influence their behaviour and their mental health and wellbeing. I'm just waiting for the next slide to come up. We're all here today to consider, learn and reflect about early childhood wellbeing and education. The first symbol on the screen represents these connections, connecting with education, early childhood and wellbeing. The second symbol represents branches of thinking and feeling. Sometimes unexpected feelings may come up for you during this session, during sessions like today. So remember to take care of yourself and keep yourself safe. We'll also be inviting you to interact and contribute today. So contribute only what you feel comfortable with and you, when, when you feel okay about it. Having a sense of safety is necessary for positive mental health, a sense of security and for forming relationships. And this is represented by the third symbol. This means, sorry, I've lost the slide. It's gone on to the next slide. So this means that all people are safe to be who they are, able to work to their strengths, 
express their opinions and beliefs and feel heard and respected even when there are opposing views, particularly important in sessions like today. So having a conversational yarn, the last of the symbols on, on the screen, on the screen that was there before, is really important for relationship building and for making sense of feeling and thinking. So be aware of what comes up for you and make sure you talk to somebody if difficult difficulties or difficult feelings occur. Just a reminder that there are no wrong questions or answers today. So we ask your responses and comments show care, empathy and respect. Children learn from the adults around them by experiencing their relationships with them and by observing adults relating to other adults and children. Children show us what they learn and know and feel by how they behave. Adults being aware of how to look after themselves Supporting each other and demonstrating this can make a huge difference to all adults, to the well-being of the team and to the children in our care. This helps the child build a picture of who they are. So Bridget's now going to add some detail around behaviour as we start to explore how adult interactions influence children's behaviour. Bridget? Interruption. You're just trying to reconnect Bridget on the telephone. Oh. I could take over Bridget a um, little bit. So as soon as the word behaviour is mentioned, it often has a negative connotation. What do we mean? So what comes to mind when you think about behaviour? Today we will be exploring the term behaviour and understand what we mean by that talking about what influences educators' responses to children's behaviour, looking at relationships and children's behaviour and looking at useful strategies. We'll also be providing an opportunity to reflect on your own challenges with children's behaviour, exploring the connection between behaviour and children's social and emotional development. So Bridget, I've just talked to slide four, so we're up to slide five. Hi Bridget, you're back online. Thank you. Hi everybody. So what do we mean when we are talking about behaviour? So everything we do and the way we act is a behaviour and that's the same for children. But in this context, we're talking about children's behaviour that we as educators and adults may find challenging or that's causing us concern. When a child is behaving in a certain way, that is the expression of their emotions and sometimes that evokes an emotion in us as adults. So the rapid development in the early years means that children's behaviour needs to be viewed within a developmental framework. So the first thing we often see is the behaviour the child displays. And that's, you know, that's what's jumping out at, out at us. So behaviours that could be concerning later in childhood, um, sometimes are those that you would actually expect to see, obviously, in infants or um, the early years. So for example, being distressed when a primary caregiver is out of sight is expected for a 10 month old baby, but that could be more concerning for a four year old. So we can think about behaviours in two broad categories and that's what we'll talk about today, externalising and internalising. So externalising behaviours are under controlled behaviours. So when we say under controlled, we um, think about the child not having control over their their emotions and that's why um, they are externalising behaviours in this way. And they're relatively easy to recognise and they're the ones that often jump out at us as educators because they can feel quite disruptive. And they can be a sign of a child looking for support and connection from an adult. So some of these may include fighting with other children, 
hitting, spitting, throwing themselves on the ground or having difficulty engaging. So when talking about behaviour that looks like, looks like that, in this context we're talking about behaviour that's worrying or causing us concern as educators. So now let's have a look at internalising behaviours, which is the other behaviour that children may display. Internalising behaviours can include inhibited and over-controlled behaviours, such as withdrawal, hiding, children isolating themselves, and those behaviours can be a lot more difficult to detect um, as adults and as educators, as they're mostly experienced internally by the child and not always noticed by others. But um, when we say over-controlled, we mean that the child has a bit more control over, over that behaviour and that's why they're doing that. So remember that when we're talking about all of these things, these are the behaviours that we're noticing and that are finding and that we're, we may be finding challenging. But that's different to an emotion, which is often what is behind the behaviour that the child is experiencing. So how we respond and react to all types of children's behaviour has a significant impact on their social and emotional development. Okay, so we're going to have a look at a story now that Janelle is going to take us through. So this, <coughs> pardon me, this is the um, case study that you received when you registered or received soon after when you registered. There's a copy in the chat if you need to have another little look at the case study. Um, but I'll just give you a minute to do that. So this is a story of children who said you won't let me be good because of the context really that the children were in at the time and the year one teacher in this story commented that these words have stayed with her forever ever since and have been a reminder to consider her influence when reflecting on what's happening with children so this could be a reminder for all of us the behaviour is what we see. We need to look at what we say and do when considering influence on, influences on children's behaviour and also look at the context that we're providing for children and look at the environment, including things like the timetable, which is what affected um, these children. And um, of course, we as adults are influenced by many things. So now we're going to do a poll. So let's look at the poll now to see what influences your responses to behaviours. So if you just uh, click on the section that, in, that influences you most, I think you can click on more than one and we'll see what, what those influences pan out to be like. Janelle, I reflect regularly on my time as an educator and think how I might have done things differently or how I might have handled a situation differently. And I think over time my biggest learning was that when it came to responding to children's behaviour, in those moments of feeling frustrated or feeling like I didn't have control or feeling so challenged by a behaviour that you just don't know what to do, um, if I step back and really thought for a second, well, what am I doing? What, what is the environment that I've set up doing to influence this child behave, child's behaviour? And it really allowed me to take, take some responsibility and feel like I did have some control over the situation um, when I really looked at those influences rather than just having those feelings of frustration and challenge. And I think one sure thing, one of the sure things we can do is look at our responses first rather and that can influence children's responses as well. And we might stop the poll now and clearly education knowledge and experience comes up Trump. 94% of people feel that was the biggest influence. And your own cultural background values and beliefs. 
And that can be sometimes a tricky thing to know about because you've really got to dig deep to look at your own cultural background, values and beliefs because you don't know what you don't know. So very interesting um, outcomes there and how you feel on the day was, the, was another one. And obviously everyone here today is um, here to continue increasing their knowledge and, and reflecting on that. So that's great to see that in the poll. Good point. So just as there are many influences on educator or adult responses to children's behaviour, there are just as many influences on children and their behaviour. So one way to look at this is to, to view the famous Bronson Brenner's Ecological Systems Series. And that's going to be on the next slide. So you may well be aware of this model. And it recognises there are multiple influences on children's mental health and wellbeing which influences children's behaviour. As this model shows, the community, family, early childhood setting and broader societal factors are all included. So it's a complex relationship between the child and each of these influences that in turn have a relationship with each other. It's the interrelationship of many systems at all different levels that impact on the child and the child impacts on each of these systems. The child never acts in isolation and neither do we as adults. It's also important to acknowledge how each child's special genetic and biologically influenced personality trait known as temperament affects how these interrelationships work and how others and how others treat each other when temperament's part of the story. So Bronfen Brenner's socio-ecological model is all about relationships and relationships play a critical role in developing a child, a young child's capacity to experience, regulate and express emotions, form close and secure interpersonal relationships and explore the environment and learn, all in the context of relationships with family, early learning services, community and cultural expectations for young children. There are also growing bodies of research that provide a scientific base now for the importance of relationships. There's research around connections in the brain, hormone production like oxytocin and cortisol, sensory systems, regulation systems, and um, research on promoting relationships like circle of security. There's a general agreement that good quality relationships are respectful, responsive, sensitive, consistent, secure and stable, that they're a protective factor for mental health. They're central to both the national quality standard and the early years learning framework and they support the foundation for all other learning. So children who are connected feel they belong to their family and their learning service and community are more likely to, to develop a strong identity, a positive sense of self and a strong relationship with others. Thanks Janelle. So really knowing children well is so important, which um, we all know in all areas of um, supporting children in early learning services, but um, especially when thinking about behaviour, it makes a big difference. Knowing a child well means knowing them in the context of their family, the early learning service and the community, as Janelle has just spoken about. So individual knowledge of a child includes educators being aware of a child's likes and dislikes, interests and preferred play experiences, usual behaviour including their signals, triggers and facial expressions, family context and broader socio-cultural backgrounds. And as educators we can develop individual, individual knowledge of children in our education and care services by observing them closely across different contexts and with different peer groups spending one-on-one -on -one time with children, even just briefly through the day, that can um, allow you to get to know children really well. Reflecting on what might be motivating a child's behaviour in particular situations, 
and seeking out information from families and other educators. So we need to know what social and emotional skills children have and what is possible for them at a particular age. Because having appropriate expectations of children's social and emotional skills for different ages and stages is really important for the interactions that we have with children, which can then in turn influence children's behaviour. So the network of attitudes, skills and knowledge that develops children's social capacity um, consequently affects their social behaviour. So the behaviour of a child indicates what's happening for that child socially and emotionally. Their emotional sense of self is reflected in their behaviour. A sense of self is about children's developing capacity to feel positive about themselves and their capabilities. So having that knowledge of social and emotional skills, which um, I'm sure many of you already do, is, is key to then having appropriate expectations of children. So we definitely recommend um, to refresh on core social and emo emotional skills in the early years regularly to reflect and check back in on the expectations that you have of children at different ages and stages. Mm -hmm. Obviously realising that all children do develop at their own pace and in an individual way. So there'll be a link in chat to um, a core social and emotional skills in early childhood document that um, can be a good reminder. So to interact and respond to children's behaviour in an intentional and respectful way, we need to scaffold the social and emotional skills that children are developing. So as educators, we tend to know how to do this with other skills and, and learning areas and areas of children's development, but often it's a real challenge with behaviour. So when responding to a child displaying behaviours that you find challenging as an educator, you need to think carefully about how you want to support the child and how you will do that. So throughout the day, there are many opportunities for educators to support children's social and emotional development, either incidental or intentional, through all sorts of play experiences and routines and um, different teaching opportunities. But educators can interpret what's happening for children socially and emotionally by observing their behaviour. And we all know the importance of observation in an early learning setting. Observations lead us to notice patterns of behaviour over time and in different situations. And that then assists in relevant, meaningful and deliberate planning that is individual for that child. So to be able to intentionally teach in in an appropriate way, observation really is, is key for that. And especially when we talk about behaviour. So when observing behaviour, it's very important to see the behaviour in its full context. Just as we spoke about before with the socio-ecological model, what happened before, during and after with who the child was, where the child was, when it happened, all of these things, the context of the behaviour is extremely important to note. Having that information will inform you about what influenced the behaviour and will help put it in perspective. So triggers of behaviour can be many different things and very varied. Change of educators, transitions, other children, and that's just to name a few, but um, just like social and emotional development, triggers for children's behaviour will be individual for each child and that's why we spoke about getting to know children really well. So observe behaviours that are considered inappropriate for the age and stage of development of the child. They may actually just be inappropriate in that particular context or situation. The behaviour in another context may be totally developmentally and age appropriate because obviously children transition through different stages and different situations and environments and different contexts in their life. So when, when that happens, we call it mistaken behaviour. Um, and during the process of learning, children will inevitably make mistakes and they'll experiment with their social and emotional responses to different situations. So as educators, it's really important for us to consider what the function of a child's behaviour is. Often children display behaviours that educators 
can find challenging because the child doesn't know what else to do in that situation because they may be trying to seek a connection with somebody or achieve a particular goal or simply looking for love and security. So there are tools that can assist educators in working out the reasons behind a child's behaviour and these are a really useful step when observing. So in chat we're putting in a tool that's called Beatles and it's a really useful tool for documenting information and observations for all children um, and especially if you are um, finding a particular behaviour behavior challenging. So the acronym for BEATLES is Behaviour, Emotions, Thoughts, Learning and Social Relationships. And the observation chart provides a template for gathering and documenting information and observations about a child and particular concerns that you may have. So when observing children's behaviour, it's helpful to include the details um, such as who is impacted by the behaviour, where does it happen, when does it happen? How long has it been going on for? How often do you see this behaviour? And how much does the behaviour impact on the child and others? So I'm just going to give you a minute to read the scenario on screen. So we'd really like to hear your thoughts when you first read that, if that happens in, in front of you, what do you think you would do? What would be your first response? We'd really like people to share and chat if they're happy to. And there's no right or wrong answer, it's just to guide discussion and reflection. So if a child joins a group of children building with blocks but instead of joining in the play knocks down what the other children were building, what would your response be? Often the response of an educator may be to encourage the child to find something else to do, um, remove the child from the situation. But we have to remember that behaviour is what the behaviour is what we're seeing, and that's often what we think to respond to. So the behaviour of knocking down the block. Um, but what we need to be thinking about in that moment is what's really going on for that child. What what might be the um, emotion behind the behaviour. So if we think about this this child who might feel is, um, who we might feel is being disruptive in his approach to the other children, um, he might not have the social and emotional skills to join the group in an effective way and this could then result in behaviour that's being labelled as inappropriate which can lead to negative responses from other children and more frustration from the child. So I can see we're getting some suggestions in chat now, which is great. So some suggestions include modelling the behaviour wanting that you want to see um, to help the child, you know, rebuild the blocks and and to talk them through those um, those skills. So that's great. Comfort the crying child and speak about how it's not a kind thing to do. So focusing on on the emotion behind that. So talking to the child about, to Jason, the child about why the other child is crying um, and then speaking to the child whose box were knocked down um, to see how they're feeling as well. Asking the child why he knocks it down, so trying to find out that. 
it can depend on what you thought um, Jason was was trying to get out of the behaviour. Was he trying to play or trying to create some kind of um, reaction or attention? Lots of ideas coming through here. Assist all children to be heard and acknowledge all children's feelings. That's really important that we're not forgetting about any of the children being affected in that situation. And he may be feeling a range of emotions. And so you've all, um, a lot of you have um, linked it back to, to the feelings of, of the child himself but also the other children, which is really important, that focus on social and emotional um, you know, the skills that he needs in that situation. So it's really great to hear some of the different approaches because really removing the child from the group, the question is, will he be any better equipped to join the group next time? So you're all, you've all um, included responses that involve you as an educator supporting the child, which is so important because in that situation, Jason needs help from the educator to learn how to join the group properly. So it, it could be better to stay with him and scaffold his learning and help him participate in a more appropriate way. Obviously, depending on, on the situation, we need to think when is the appropriate time to scaffold that the child. So sometimes there needs to be time for children to calm down and be in a, in a state that allows them to learn and and to reflect and, and be supported by an educator. So um, I think there's some great suggestions there in, in chat, but what a few of you have mentioned is that it does depend. It depends on, on the situation and hopefully you would know the child well and that would support the way you respond to that behaviour. So now we'll have a little look at what else um, can influence our responses because that's, you know, that's a big part of what we're um, exploring today, what influences the way we respond to children. So it's important to consider strategies that you may use to respond. And um, by reflecting on how you would respond to that scenario, that's a, a great start. So when a child presents a behaviour that challenges you, um, it's really important to take a moment and pause so that you can actually respond rather than react. And often, especially with externalising behaviours, it's, you know, it's natural to just react because it's often something um, quite loud and, and obvious. So you can do a body scan, take a deep breath and be aware of your feelings, which are really important in this situation. It only takes a moment but it allows you to find a space to listen to what's happening. So we looked at one side of the Beatles tool before, which was the observation tool for children. We can use the other side of the tool to consider your own reflections and feelings about children's behaviour. And like I said, it really is just as important because the way you respond to children's behaviour does have an impact. And being aware of your feelings really um, contributes to that response. So it's equally as important to reflect on your own feelings and approaches as well as children. So we've put another copy of the Beatles tool in chat, I think, but it was in there before. So let's look at what can influence our responses to children's behaviour. So in those situations like the block scenario or any situation where a behaviour is right there, what can get in the way of responding in children's best interest? Oh, look how quickly time <laughs> pressure <laughs> came up. Oh, that time. And I'm sure everyone here today can relate to that because there's probably a number of other children who are also requiring support in a way at that time. And overwhelmed, being overwhelmed is coming, it's becoming more and more mm. evident, I think. Yeah. And because there's lots of knowledge and experience and um, ideas about how to respond to children's 
um, behaviour, but every situation is so different. So I think that's key, overwhelming. And the key really is about knowing the individual child, isn't it? And tuning into Absolutely. their needs at any, any particular time. And we didn't really know a lot about Jason from the from the um, the little the, the little thing with scenario we had, but mm. so it was good to see a range of ideas coming up because yeah, you don't really know what's happening yeah, that's for him. Nice. Um, Michelle said in chat, not fully seeing what has gone on with the behaviours. Yeah, yeah, and that's easy absolutely. in a busy classroom. Yeah, and Ray you might touch the tail end. Yeah, and Raylene said sometimes staffing can play a factor and ensuring all educators are on the same page. Good point. Oh, it's such that a good everybody. point. The yeah. Cons consistent approach and um, hopefully these discussions about behaviour can help um, your team, you know, talk about what behaviour means and, and what that means to you as a, as a team and try to so get having that consistent. Understanding. And having a shared understanding, I think, is critical, yeah. Absolutely. So I think if we're aware of what can get in the way of responding in children's best interests when behaviours occur, um, when you do take that, that minute to do a body scan and think, how do I feel right now, you can, you can think about some of these potential barriers and um, you know, try to reflect on well, what what's the best way to respond right now? And I just noticed that Kate said she agrees with support from staff. I think mm. support from team members is critical. And then Michelle also mentioned not understanding the emotions behind the behaviour. So I wonder if people have seen the iceberg picture with the behaviour at the top and all the feelings underneath. Mm. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. Oh, and Tegan mentioned not utilising ser the services that are available. Mm. Interesting, yeah, good point. And even knowing what the services knowing. are. Knowing, yeah, that's right. That's mm. the first, first step. So, here's another little... No, I just need to move my screen down so I could have a look at it. Here's another little moment that has been observed and I might read it out this time. So the children had been carefully observing a nearby swan's nest. They'd watched and talked about the shared parenting of the mother and father swans and were eagerly anticipating hatching of the eggs. Unfortunately, a downpour of rain caused the river levels to rise and washed the nest and the eggs away and all efforts to save at least some of those eggs failed. So here's another question for the chat. What would you do? What would you do if that happened at your service? That's the first thing you'd do. So while we're waiting for some responses in the chat, Bridget, what would you do if this happened at your service? <laughs> yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me, Janelle, is um, documentation actually, um, documenting this event with the children. So maybe there were some photos that were taken um, before the, the downpour that could be used, but also um, encouraging the children to, to remember you know what they saw and and document the event with you so they might be able to to draw or through art or you can write the words or the story that they're sharing um, because often you know writing a shared story can help children make sense of what's happened and um, that could also then be used to support emotional language and um, understandings of the feelings they're having and Tony mentioned in the chat discussing the circle of life and you could even mm. use, uh, do a, a, a graphic of the circle of life and the person before said um, talking about how children were feeling about yeah. that incident yeah so I think this is a great moment to share about children's feelings and talk about and linking the feelings to what happened yes yeah. mm. 
and allowing children to feel what they're feeling and that's important and that's okay and I think um, someone mentioned that in here be honest with the children ask how they feel because it's okay to feel sad or cross or whatever the feeling may be yeah it's a great opportunity <laughs> The chat is going so fast that I can't read. <laughs> I can't read it. Um, so discussion around mission. resilience. Ah, good. Yeah, good one. And Michelle said, listen to the children's response, observe their behaviours to ascertain how appropriately they react to their needs. Be mm. honest about life cycles. Yeah, and factual discuss feelings and make these connections I'm using other forms to express feelings as well as verbal yeah yeah good point that's right different mm. ways of documenting that so knowing what happened talking about what happened and talking about how you feel at the same time is a really good way of of making sense what happened of what happened to children and also talking about feelings knowing what the feeling is and having a name for it so there are kind of two levels to that knowing what it is and having a name for it and Julie said lost it <laughs> Karen said display pictures and research about the swans so children can revisit their learning I think that's a really good point because mm, you have a, a response or a reaction at the time, but later on, after you've thought about it, you might it might develop into another response or reaction as you grow and as you understand more and as you make sense of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And um, Julie said about letting children make some artwork to share their feelings and express them in different ways. And I think that's a great way to then be able to continue the conversation you know, on an ongoing basis, like Janelle just said. And I think it's important to remember too, connecting, we might just go back back a slide. Um, thanks, Maria. Connecting on an emotional level first without the words. So connect first, mm -hmm. that helps with children's regulation their emotional regulation, so connect first and then redirect by naming it, naming the feeling and naming mm. the feeling also helps tame the feeling. So if you name it, it helps tame it, but connecting on an emotional level first before you do anything else helps with the regulation. I think that. And making the most of moments like these as well as stories and other everyday moments knowing they're perfect times to help children experience and learn about emotions this will assist a language of emotions to develop and that will help children in their growing capacity to be social and learn mm -hmm. i think that's um important to remember and we've got you know, with a huge number of storybooks and and videos and things like that that we use and often you know we might read the story but if you look at the emotional part of the story or the social part of the story pulling out those bits and pieces is a really good way to develop children's social and emotional learning and by acknowledging situations like this Janelle and um, you know sharing the, the things that have happened as a result the the artwork the conversations that have happened with children sharing that with families is such a great way of you know, role modelling to families, the important focus that should be placed on, on children's emotions and recognising their feelings. So I think it really spreads that, that message. And, you know, I think we're getting better at doing that. I think mm. we're, we're, it's, um, I'm seeing a lot of really good practices around. Absolutely. That are, yeah, talking about social and emotional development and behavioural, behavioural development. So as we grow, draw closer to the end of this workshop, let's take a moment to think about what can get in the way of these things happening. So having this conversation 
about exactly what can get in the way helps us become more aware of what's going on for us. And that can mm. change daily, can't it? <laughs> the kind of conversation can also clarify just how important educators are in the lives of children. Help us realise how valuable it is to view each situation through the child's eyes based on all that you know about the child. The, import, the importance of being aware of our own strengths and those of our colleagues and using those strengths. Highlight current skills and knowledge and skills and knowledge that could be extended. Clarify how critical the quality of our relationship with individual children is or are. And finally, we need to really remember to keep kind, be kind to ourselves and make sure the expectations of ourselves are doable. I think they're really important points to remember when we're reflecting on what can get in the way. And I think that reflection, Janelle, is something I'd encourage people to do with their teams and with, with the educators together at your service to develop that shared understanding. I agree. <laughs> so we're going to do one last poll and spend a bit more time talking about some of your questions and comments. So to reflect on what's happening, tell us what strategies you already use or you'd like to develop further or begin using or learn more about. So team meetings and reflective journals are up there. Hmm. Conversations with family. And talking with a mentor or colleague, not necessarily from the service. Good point, because we can extend those networks to um, other colleagues outside of our service. And I can see to know that team meetings and reflective journals are sitting quite high. And I think they're both um, two really dedicated times for reflection. So it's great to see that that you know, that, that's happening. But um, I guess it, it could be good following today to think about what opportunities do you have for reflecting on your influences, you know, the influences that um, on children's behaviours and the way you respond to children's behaviours just regularly, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in those moments where they, it can be really challenging. And Joan just mentioned looking for online resources for further reading. Mm. To really, we've got access to so much information now. But it's really, I think it's really important though to access information that's evidence based. So we know we're accessing information from really, really good sources. And um, I was just thinking too of the Beatles chart, using the side of the Beatles chart that focuses on our reflection might be a really good focus for team meetings mm. and you could choose a child you're bothered about or a situation you're bothered about and really um, use that side of the form to dig deep into what's happening for you and what is happening for your colleague. I don't know that we spend time talking about those sorts of things in our meetings. We're so busy talking about That's everything right. else that has to be talked about. And also on the poll there, Janelle, discussing with um, a mentor or colleague, not even necessarily from your service, came up, um, which was great to see because that can be really worthwhile if there's someone in in the early childhood space that you have um, have a relationship with that can really, um, you know, challenge your reflection and, and um, you know, delve a bit deeper into the way you reflect. So I think that's, um, that's great to see that that may be something some people have. I think that's more important, yeah, more important than we realise, I think. 
using those mentors out or inside our service and outside our service. When I look back on yeah, some of the um, teaching positions I've had and the mentors that have really helped me reflect, it's not helping me do my job, it's helping me reflect on what I've, what I've been doing. And video reflection didn't come um, up overly high on the poll, but is that something that anyone has used as a means to reflect on practice using video? If it is, you're welcome to share in chat. I wonder if videos of your own people videoing your your own practice or watching videos of practice. Yeah, it could be Not both ways. And now one of the services I'm working with videoed some educators at the beginning of the day for a, a length of time and they used those videos uh, to reflect on in staff meetings. I think mm. it's really brave. I think it's really brave <laughs> to be videoed and to and to look at yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let other people talk about you. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Mm. So maybe you could start by looking at videos that, that are already out there. So that's a good, yeah, good point. Good point. And yeah, <laughs> and that's a good point. And Sally said inclusion professionals and PSFOs can support educators with reflective questions, uh, reflective conversations. So mentors mm -hmm. and or other professionals, good point. Yep. And yeah, people who do resource teaching type positions and inclusion support positions, because they see so many different educators across so many different settings. So they've got it; they're coming at everything from a different perspective. Really valuable. It's always great to take the time to reflect on how we reflect. Yeah, reflect on reflection on reflection. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so we might now talk about some some other ways of, of reflecting, reflecting on our perhaps. practice. <laughs> so Bridget's going to talk about some ways now. And we're looking at um, some symbols on screen and these are ways that have been um, developed and grown from work and learning that was done using Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander pedagogy and these um, symbols just to encourage reflection on all sorts of um, work we do and, and practices that we have but today we'll use them to look at reflecting on our interactions with children and see how each way could relate to the daily interactions that we have with children and um, how that could be contributing to behaviour. So let's um, think about our expectations, we'll go back to, to thinking about expectations of, of children and behaviour. So acknowledge, consider, celebrate. So it's really um, important to notice and acknowledge when a child uses a social or emotional skill. That's all part of their, their learning about what um, those different emotions feel like and mean and how to you know, deal with different social situations. Connect. So how through your connections with children and the interactions you have with them, can you support them to generate ideas about how to manage their feelings and difficult situations that they may be in? And how can you help them and support them to do that through the relationship you have with them? Be, feel, think, do. So we need to use concrete examples to show children how and when to use a skill. So often using the, the play situations that are there are a really good opportunity for that. So supporting a child to enter and sustain a play experience with another child. Learn many ways. So we need to model social and emotional skills through our interactions with children. So we've spoken a lot about um, intentional teaching opportunities today, but what about what children are learning through what they're observing and, and being modelled each day from educators, the way educators interact with 
other children with each, with each other and with families. And verbalising helpful thoughts um, to, you know, to calm down situations and, and follow challenging experiences with children, but even for ourselves to role model that. Grow. What are some of the things um, that we can let go of so that children can grow and learn? And I think that's that difference between reacting and responding. If we take that minute to think, you know, how do I need to respond here or do I need to respond here? How are we allowing and supporting children to grow through our interactions with them? Make safe. So we need to reflect on how we're arranging the physical and social environments to support children to practice particular social and emotional skills. So providing safe spaces for them to learn and, and grow and, and make mistakes and, and try different situations and practice those skills. And finally, conversation. So how do we encourage children to express what they're feeling in the moment, whether it's a positive or a difficult feeling? And I think um, we had some great ideas based on that scenario earlier about that. So these are just some of the ways that you can reflect. And if you are not a participating service, you can register and um, a consultant would be able to support you in exploring these ways further and engage in that reflection um, at a deeper level. So we're going to start wrapping things up and in chat there'll be a form if you are interested in registering. Because these webinars are just, um, you know, one of the, resources that Kids Matter has to offer and there are plenty um, of great ways to learn and reflect and put your learning into action and um, continue professional learning with Kids Matter. Um, so the registration link is in chat if you are interested in becoming a, a participating service and for people that are already registered and are attending today, um, definitely let your consultant know that you've attended the webinar today um, because it might just be um, what you need to finish off a topic, some of the learnings from today. And there may be other resources and information that um, your consultant could guide you to as well. And Bridget, can I just buck in and say that Talithia okay. says she uses these symbols in her daily curriculum and links each experience with a symbol. That's wonderful. Yeah. So that's using those in a reflective way, but yeah, in a slightly different way, but still for reflection. Yeah. And um, please take the time before you um, log out today to fill out the exit survey that will put up, be put up on screen soon and include the names of anyone watching with you so they get a certificate too. And there are other online events that you can attend. Um, we have national check-ins. Um, if you're a registered service, you can join a national check-in and talk about what you've learned and done. Um, you might even like to discuss this webinar. Um, and just remember that the check-ins, they're not check-ups at all. Um, they're just about consultants supporting you to spot the great learning and action that's already being done in your service, probably without you noticing. And it's often easier for an outside pair of eyes to see that. So make sure you stay in regular contact with the Kids Matter team. Thank you, Janelle. And I'll just check that there's no other questions. If there are any final questions, feel free to pop them in. And we apologise for a few of the technical difficulties at the beginning, but we got there and we hope you all um, enjoyed the webinar today. And thanks everybody for coming.